We now take a deep dive into a key defense against the climate crisis, oceans. They absorb 90% of excess heat caused by climate change, while also taking in roughly a quarter of human-caused CO2 emissions. But rising temperatures are threatening ocean health, and the consequences could be dire. And we swim through that topic tonight with Emeritus Professor Chao Lokming from the NUS Reef Ecology Lab and Fabian Costo, founder of the Fabian uh, Costo Ocean Learning Centre and Proteus Ocean Group. I want to start with you, Mr Costo. Uh, looking at your family background, you are as close to ocean-faring royalty as it gets, famously uh, going scuba diving for the first time on your fourth birthday. Now, that would have been 1971, so 51 years on since your first trip into the ocean. How do you rate the health of the ocean today? How has it changed? <laughs> you make it sound like it's so long ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, the ocean has changed quite drastically since I was a child. And if you look over three generations, uh, that, that drastic change, that shifting baselines has, has been even more dramatic. Uh, so in a very short amount of time, we've changed uh, not only the ecosystem, but the life support system that we all depend on for everything from the food sources to the very air that we breathe. Uh, and that's quite alarming. Uh, Mr. Cousteau, the, the ocean is, of course, a critical piece of the puzzle in terms of solving climate change. Uh, but oceans, too, are affected by all those greenhouse gases. Uh, the importance of the ocean, that's going to be discussed next week at COP27. What are you hoping to come out of these discussions? And how far do conferences like this, and also the, the Ocean Collective Summit, for that matter, spur action to protect the health of our oceans? Well, in my opinion, it's never enough, of course, because we've lost a lot of time in these discussions and these debates, and it's now time for action. Uh, we know what the problems are. We know uh, to some extent how to cure them. And the worst thing we can do is not do anything and have more debates. And, and although we certainly can talk about the finer points and, and differences of opinion, but at the end of the day, we know the general trajectory we need to be on, and it takes taking those first steps. They won't be perfect, but they're better than where we are today. And those need to encompass three general topics. The topic of climate change and all its related issues. The topic of overconsumption of our world's oceanic resources. Uh, and, of course, the pollution issue, which is illustrated typically by plastics, but not just plastics, all sorts of chemical runoffs that are quite literally choking our life support system, the ocean. Oh, Professor Chow, uh, let's bring you into the conversation at this point and zoom in more specifically on Singapore. Oh, you have had more than 40 years of expertise on this topic, uh, a special uh, focus on coral reef restoration and coastal management as well. What, in your view, are the key ocean conservation issues that Singapore faces can and can actually do something about? I think one, one of the uh, key issues for Singapore is that uh, uh, our sea space is very limited. Uh, we have about 6,000 square kilometres seas, and uh, they are being intensively used. Uh, you, you can see that uh, Singapore is uh, easily one of the world's busiest harbours, and uh, we have been undergoing uh, decades of urbanization, and this has resulted in our coastlines being uh, quite extensively extensively modified. A lot of the natural uh, ecosystems uh, along the shore and, and in the sea uh, have already been changed. And uh, but the the saving grace is that uh, biodiversity is still. Uh, maintained at a, at, a, at a very high level. Uh, we have, uh, for many of the populations, the abundance has, has gone down, but uh, surprisingly, biodiversity is still uh, quite healthy. Uh, and, and we are constantly, yes, we are constantly dealing with uh, different issues uh, as, as we move along. So things like climate change impacts, and, and now with uh, uh, em emerging issues like uh, plastics pollution. So, so this, these are things that we have to be uh, quite uh, 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 
able to, to we will have to be able to, to manage them. Professor Chow, Singapore has been pushing for sustainable development. Uh, we have our Singapore Green Plan 2030. Uh, organizations like WWF, they're joining the effort, uh, conserving, managing coastal and marine eco ecosystems. And there are also moves uh, to support this global treaty to stop uh, the marine plastic uh, pollution that uh, Mr. Cousteau perhaps spoke about. Does this count towards ocean conservation, though? And are we doing enough here in Singapore? Uh, yes, uh, the, the Singapore Green Plan, uh, uh, as, as you know, there, there is a connection between land and sea. And uh, whatever sustainable measures are uh, put in, in place uh, for the terrestrial environment uh, would have uh, a connection with the marine environment. Uh, but the sea has, has very different properties, physical properties, because of its very fluid nature. And therefore, uh, they require uh, different uh, management uh, strategies. And uh, unknown to many, uh, there is the Singapore Blue Plan. Now, this Blue Plan uh, the, the, is already uh, the, the third edition has, has uh, been published about three years ago. And it is a, a plan that, that uh, showcases uh, what kind of biodiversity we have, where are our uh, rich habitats, and it also uh, contains a lot of recommendations as to what uh, should be done. And uh, it is uh, a plan that was uh, brought up by civic groups uh, with with the backing of of academics. So uh, it it is something that uh, the the government has has uh, taken note of. And, and the, our National Parks Board is looking into that plan and uh, uh, studying it and, and uh, trying to, to see uh, what aspects of that plan can, can be incorporated. All right, to cut in here, uh, this question is for both you gentlemen, uh, but we'll start with Mr. Costo. This is about what uh, uh, gatherings or summits such as COP27 can actually do. Uh, we've already seen the unedifying sight of different countries uh, different groupings of countries pushing the blame. You did it, you fix it. Oh, no, I didn't do it. You should take responsibility. And that's already going on for oceans where there are no clear borders. Plastic pollution, what you do in one continent will affect another continent. Uh, Mr. Costo, do you see this going on? What does it take to get everyone to understand that we are all essentially in the same puddle of water? <laughs> and that's exactly the point. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we are all in the proverbial same boat. Uh, this boat happens to be called uh, Planet Earth, should be called Planet Ocean. Uh, fish don't have passports. Uh, the ocean is a universal connector. Uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, countries like Singapore are taking initiatives very seriously uh, of their own device and are leading the way in this region. Uh, but it takes uh, also its neighbors and cooperation with its neighbors to create a, a greater synergy so that we can all benefit from uh, the positive action that is happening. Platforms like, uh, like, like COP uh, and others uh, are uh, are interesting de uh, debate stages, but at the end of the day, it's all uh, about action at this point. Uh, and with that said, the Ocean Collective uh, Summit here in Singapore uh, is about uh, not only uh, education and training of uh, really interesting and important information about the ocean, but also engagement, engagement by local communities, engagement by local NGOs and, and, and government entities that will be able to partner together as one to be able to implement the solutions necessary for today and a better future for tomorrow so that our children get to enjoy what we and our ancestors have taken for granted. All right, and uh, taking the same question to Professor Chana, you mentioned climate change and plastic pollution as something that in Singapore we very specifically face. Uh, if you could give a more targeted, specific answer to how you have been able to, I don't know, address or alleviate some of that problem from the Singapore perspective? Uh, I think it's, it's through uh, regional coll collaboration. Uh, there are, uh, for, for the region, uh, we, we have intergovernmental uh, organizations, and this is where you have government representatives. Uh, they meet, they, they come together, uh, agree on what, 
what kind of uh, measures should be adopted. And then uh, this, this would then be implemented uh, back in, in the different countries. And, and I, I can say that uh, some of these uh, intergovernmental organizations uh, have, have been uh, quite, quite uh, successful in uh, at least uh, trying to ramp up uh, management uh, of, of the marine area. And there are also examples from, from the region where things have really been turned around. Uh, and, and this should be uh, taken and, and uh, many countries can, can learn, learn from such examples. So uh, I think uh, the collaboration should, should just be maintained uh, because there's, there's no way uh, one country alone can they can try to manage it within their waters, but then, as as you know, the the seas would would transfer, transport all kinds of materials uh, across international boundaries. So uh, the the need for for collaboration is is very strong, very high. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your insights and for sharing them with us. Uh, we've been speaking there to Fabian Cousteau, founder of the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Centre and Proteus Ocean Group, as well as Emeritus Professor Chao Lok Ming from NUS Reef Ecology Lab. Thank you.